Hey everybody, right, this is a very long overdue video. I've been asked by so many people, Jay, what do I look out for when I'm buying a Technics turntable or a pair of Technics turntables secondhand from a private seller on eBay or anywhere? What do I look out for? How do I know it's worth buying? And uh, am I buying a lemon or am I buying what you call a Franken deck? So apologies for the long overdue video on this, but I've been so busy with work. You all know the score by now. So let's get into this. Here we have a original Technics 1210 Mark II. When I say original, nothing has been touched on this deck. I've not opened any of this up. It's going to be open by me for servicing, slider units and all the usual bits. But here we have a very nice condition Mark II, okay? So you look at this and you, you look at it as it is. You plug it in, um, you know, you spin it up, you look at the pitch control and you go, oh, it's all right, fantastic. And start it and go, here's your money. That's what a lot of people do if they don't know what they're looking for. Now, I'm not going to rip into, you know, take the platter off or plastic cover, etc. on this one here. These are the basic things that you look for if you are buying a set of original condition Mark IIs. If they've been refurbished or they've been resprayed, these are obvious things that you will be able to see when you look at the turntable. I'd like to think they're obvious. Things like graphics not being very sharp, not sitting at the correct angle, not lining up properly. You know, these are all basic things, LED kits, cables, etc. So this being an original unit, you can all see it's nice and clean here. Pitch trim on this is a little bit dusty, but again, this is all going to be cleaned up. We're not going to replace the trim on this one here. It's going to be cleaned up um, just to keep it as original possible as what my customer has asked for. So really important things to, to look for. One of the most important things to look for when you're buying a second and second hand Mark II or Mark V M3D, etc. The first thing you want to check is the arm okay very expensive you can buy tubes separately but if you want an original panasonic unit that's in good condition like this one here is you need to check to make sure that the bearings are okay and you also need to check to make sure that the arm tube is not bent okay so the idea when you have a um a technics turntable let me quickly go and grab my autophon record i'm going to show you this stay with me <clears throat> Right, okay, I should have really had this nearer <laughs> nearer the camera. But here we've got an autophon unit that's been screwed on now. It's identical to the older uh, autophon units. So this arm, if you imagine here, you look underneath and you can see it from the top, there's a good finger and a quarter's distance between the stylus and the plimp. So I can basically get my, my main pointing finger underneath the stylus. It's not touching at all. There's a big gap distance here. And from looking at the turntable front on and side on, there's no bend. Because what you're meant to do when you level up a tone arm and you actually adjust the, the balance and you get your weight where it needs to be, anti-skate, etc., you need to make sure that the actual arm is sitting level. So a lot of scratch DJs tend to either turn the rear weight round to add more weight or they'll put the height up as high as it can be to angle the uh, the actual stylus and the arm onto your turntable and your record so that way it creates more uh, more weight going onto the stylus obviously it's going to wear your stylus down quicker and in theory wear down your records a lot quicker as well but that's what a lot of turntablers tend to do so you have your anti, -anti scrape at zero height up as high as it can be and the arm needs to angle you need to stay very well clear of turntables if you don't want any hassle or having to spend money where it's not needed and you want to just buy a set that's fully working with no issues stay clear of anything that the stylus physically touches the plinth where you can see it scratch the plinth a lot of them come through to me where the arm tube is bent now the problem you have if the tube is bent nine times out of ten you've got problems with the bearings so bearings when they are damaged again so many people have been asking me about this and i'm really sorry i've not got around to doing this video but i've got two examples here to show you so if you look at this video here and i might get my lamp and pop the lamp a little bit further over you might be able to see it's better but if you look at the top of the bearing and then you look at the bottom of the bearing, you see how the bottom bearing is a ring that goes over the top. So this bearing unit here completely pops out. So they're pressed in from factory, okay? It's like, a, if you call it a half moon shape underneath where the ball bearings will all sit. They're tiny minuscule ball bearings that go underneath. And there's at the top section of the bearing, it's what I call it a plate that goes over the top. What will happen is if there's any impact on top of the arm, something violently hits that arm, the pivot is a fine point, like a needle point that sits in between. If anything is hit on top, you can already see a difference there. This one's damaged. Oh, it's fell down there, that's interesting. That's a pivot. So this is a good example. And so the pivot here is a fine needle point. 
that sits in between, looking at the camera trying to do this, in between the bearings and moves the ball bearings around. If that plate is damaged on top, then the ball bearings will not move. So this is an example of you've got working bearings at the bottom, which you can see better from that distance, and then damaged bearings at the top. This one here is another example from muscle memory. The bottom bearing is good on this one. The top bearing on this one here, there's no bearings in there. You can see quite clearly there's no ball bearings in there at all. That's been hit so hard that all of the ball bearings have actually fall, physically fallen out of the unit. So there is no movement on this whatsoever. Unless you loosen the, <laughs> the pivot all the way off, you'll have no movement. It'll be very jerky. That's what you've got to be careful of. This is expensive. You can only buy these parts secondhand. You can buy the tubes all day long. The tubes you can buy, they're set, they, again, brand new mass-produced units from China. You can buy them. They're not original units. They'll do the same job. But if you want original, this is what you need to check. The way to check this is very simple. So if I take my arm, take it off of the lock, get my, top, my lamp out of the way again. There we go. If we then look at this and take it off the lock and we try moving, you can just about hear this, you've got movement. So if I then grab hold of the arm and lightly try and rock it backwards and forwards, there shouldn't really be any movement at all here. So put your finger on the other end here and then move it up and down, left and right, and forward and back. You will feel that there is movement. You can probably hear that if I'm quiet for a second. You can hear that, yeah? Now that could be a simple case that the, the pivots are loose and need a bit of nipping up. Now the Reloop, RP8000, 7000, straight 150 Stantons, Pioneer, PLX1000s, etc. Mixiles, turntables, they all have exactly the same problem where they're actually loose from factory. These shouldn't be loose, that should be tight. Now this is a very honest turntable. I know the owner of this deck and his second turntable. So judging from this, we shouldn't have bearing damage. Again, though, we need to check this. And I did make my customer very clear of this when the turntable was here. What you need to do is you have it so you're meant to float the entire arm. So the idea is to do it so that the entire arm is level. So if we, I'm doing this away from the camera. There shouldn't be any movement. There is slight movement here. You hold it steady. You'll see now that the arm is still moving back. And if we do put this into the middle here, so it's moving slowly again, then turn the anti-skate on without moving the arm and breaking my stylus would be a good start. Let go of it and turn the anti-skate. You'll see that it goes straight back to the rest and there is movement on the arm. Now, ideally, you want to be able to let that go and it stays exactly where it should be. If you've got tiny movement and it stops again towards the center, I wouldn't worry too much. It's everything else. If you imagine you've got a 12-inch record on there and you've got the, the, the paper section, the sticker in the middle, your record's not going to go all the way here, is it? It's going to be here. So again, if you move it here like that and let it go, there's no movement, right? And you skate on. It's moving back. Zero. Back to the rest. Here, no movement. Here, no movement. So because the pivots are a little bit loose, it's going to be difficult to see whether the bearings are damaged on this unit. But judging from the fact that it is staying where it should, there's no jerky movement. Because what can happen on a damaged one, you'll find it will move freely and it will just stop. It will rock backwards and forwards. But any loose movement like this, be careful. The first thing I would do if I was you is if he's got a, if he physically got a setup there and he's got his mixer there, I'd be trying a record on, play it from beginning to end. Don't let him talk to you over the top, trying to wow you with science and things to do and how good the decks have been. Physically play a record from start to finish. So confirm before you do it, if you're physically buying these in person, which I always recommend instead of buying them blind, take your records with you that you know are good. If you've got brand new records, even better, because you know they're not going to skip. And if you've played them, you know they're not going to skip, then great. So brand new records or your old trustworthy ones that you know got the back of your hand. Play it from start to finish. No interruptions. Don't let them say anything. Have your anti-skate on zero. Do what I've done here with the arm. If it moves back and stops and wanders, then walk away because you're going to be looking at a lot of money. If it doesn't do that and does what this one here is doing, and it's staying still until you touch the anti-skate, and it's nice and smooth, then you know you're in for a good one. This looseness here could be bearing. 
but I doubt it. I have a very, very particular feeling. I know by looking at this, there's only minimal movement. That to me will be just take the pivot out. When I rebuild the arm assembly and machine polish the pivots, pot the pivots on, recalibrate, will be good to go. I'm very confident this hasn't got damaged bearings, but that's what you look for. So like I've just shown you here, the physical damage bearing units, you're not going to check this really because obviously you've got this top and bottom. The only way of doing that is by taking the entire arm apart. On some of these versions where they have slightly longer cables, you can undo the pivot on the top and maneuver the arm in such a way that you can look at the bearings. I've done that for quite a few customers here in person while they're here. And you can see the top and just about see the bottom if the arm's going to be ripped out of the deck anyway. But you're not going to be doing that around the customer's house, around a, a seller's house, are you? Let's be honest. So that's what as an example of a damaged bearing as shown on both of these here. One hasn't got bearings at all and the other one is well just bent at the top. The plate's bent and the bearings will not move. So you won't have this issue at all with one that fully works. It'll be moving from left to right. Now pitch issues on this. Obviously it's very important to make sure when you start the turntable and you look at the strobe dots some of these turntables I've had in recently, the actual lock, even though the lock is technically working, we've actually had it where it still drifts. So the idea is, and it's actually quite surprising that a lot of DJs or familiar DJs with turntables have been using them for years, don't even know what the strobe dots do or the, how they correspond with the actual, the numbered sections on the trim. Now, if you're a newbie and you don't know anything about this, it's absolutely fine. It's absolutely no dig at you whatsoever. But what I will say to you is this. The big dot here when it's at zero, that is your 0% at the strobe, okay? That should not be moving. You may get slight movement from left to right. That's wow and flutter. It's perfectly normal. But when you take it off of the pitch and then you move it to 3.3, if it's a genuine unit, genuine slider unit, you will find, as long as it's been well looked after, they can all vary and drift slightly depending on the age and when you have to recalibrate or change units over. But from a, a normal unit that's had only a hi-fi amount of use, like this turntable has, you'll find that your pitch trim will line up roughly your 3.3, which is the second to top dot, the one directly above the big zero, is usually between 3 and 4. This one's slightly over. We've got a 3.3 at 4. Um, so it should be down a little bit lower. Some of them are a little bit over. It's not necessarily a problem. That does actually mean that the, the slider from 0 to 4 then is going to be pretty damn tight for mixing as long as the carbon track of the unit is in very good condition and well looked after. You've then got the plus 6, which are the very top strobe dots. We move this all the way to the top. If we move it, it doesn't move at all. We've got plus six. Now, some of these turntables, it will stop at plus six. Some of them will be 6.4 here. Some of them can actually be near seven, depending on how they would have been calibrated. Um, this is all down to calibration and wear and tear of the slider unit, okay? So this particular one here, it doesn't stop anymore. 6.4, technically the plus six on this is just under seven. Now, again, I'm not too fussed about this. That, to me, once I've rebuilt and recalibrated the unit, that shouldn't be very bad at all. I may even actually rebuild the original slider and recalibrate with fresh potentiometers on the board of the slider unit and the main board as well, just to make sure things are all running exactly as they should. Now, the minor scale on these decks can vary with original units. Now, most of these turntables that I tend to see... They never line up on the minus. To be honest, they never line up on anything unless they're original and they've hardly been used. You're very, very, very rare that your strobe dots will be corresponding exactly as they should unless somebody has been in there and physically tried to match it up by eye to stop them from moving on the strobe dot. So your minus 3.3, which is the bottom row of dots here that you see, is actually stopping at just over four. As you can see it here from the camera, it's actually slightly over because of the angle of the camera. You can't really see it, but that's actually over minus four again by the way this has been used if i was going to take these home exactly as they were and just use them without having any service work completed and not touch them i wouldn't be too fussed with that as long as there's no wear points so you put your record on and you try mixing it in certain positions so you could try speeding the track on the other side up and try slow a track on here trying to mix at the higher end of the spectrum slow it down mix at the lower end of the spectrum and so on and so forth you'll know if there's any dead spots or worn sections on the slider because the carbon track will wear and there are certain parts that can wear worse than others so my turntables for an example when i had my first original pair of mark II's brand new i used to start my tracks around one or two play in trance techno and hard dance i never ever went into the minus i never went in there at all it was always start from plus one or plus two and i'll always end up either right at the arse end of the spectrum because obviously playing techno i'm always playing the harder stuff so i'd always be at the top 
or it'd end up around plus six. So my slider units were more worn in the plus section than the minus. And that's, I'd probably put a bet on saying 99.9% .9 of mixing DJs, this is the same scenario with just about any turntable that you've got from new and you've been using from new. A very common one that I'm asked from a lot of customers whenever they call up saying about how mixes drift is about how, you know, they're trying to mix things in, little movements just aren't working anymore and they've got to move the slider even more to keep things locked up. Now, the first thing I say is, have you tried mixing the same records at slower speeds and using the minus range? They all say no. That's the first thing you do because that way you will know if this section here has never been used by you brand new, then in theory, the carbon track here depending on the, con on the condition of the stem underneath with the bristles that actually go underneath the stem, depending on that, you should find that your tracks lock really, really well on the minus because you've hardly ever used it. It's the plus section that you'll have a problem with. It all depends on what the deck's background is. If you're buying them again, you may, you may not notice. The owner may have had them from new, which is fantastic, and he can be totally transparent with you. Most people, when they have these from new, you know, they don't want to sell them or they just, you know, they don't want to sell them, but they have to or they fall in hard times and need to sell them. Or you've got people that move on to digital. You know, they don't want to use turntables anymore. As much as we love to think that these are the daddies, which, let's be honest, turntable-wise, these are, okay? They're the best of all of them. I mean, the Mark II, the M3D, and the Mark V, superb decks. These will always be the OG as far as I'm concerned because they are the original bad boys. They're the best you can buy as far as I'm aware. Well, as far as I'm concerned, even I'm aware they are, right? Um, but again... If you don't know what to look for, this is really, really simple. So, again, you can only really test the slider unit out physically by having it connected up to a set, such a physical setup. So if the car, if the guy's there and you're, has, it, has it all connected up together, then fantastic. If he hasn't, ask him if he's able to have them connected for you so you can test them. If he's genuinely has he's stopped doing it and he wants the sale, he'll connect them up for you. If they're sitting there in the original boxes and you open up and take them out and have a look, then yeah, I understand that. But if it's a full setup there and he's eager to sell them, then yes, you can test this as long as they let you do it, obviously. But something like that, you can replace the slider over. Just bear in mind, if you change for aftermarket sliders, because genuine units, no matter what anybody tells you on any videos or any posts you see online, genuine units for these decks that are made by Alps, that were made on behalf of Panasonic are no longer available, okay? Aftermarket units, your 3.3 will be around plus two and minus two, and your plus six will be just slightly over plus six or dead on plus six or just under plus six. If it's within spec, you'll find it will be between say five and a half onwards. Okay, that's being totally transparent and honest with you. That is the nature of an aftermarket unit. That is how they function. The curvature between zero and 3.3 is slightly steeper. When you're out of that, you are fine. So there is no issues there whatsoever. And again, it's something that can be done. I can do this for you. Any tech in the UK that knows what they're doing will be able to resource this for you and sort it. If you have scratch trims, which is this section here, the pitch trim, if this is all scratched and scuffed up, this one's got a few marks and nicks on it, but if you find that it really badly scuffed and dented, it's, again, it's not something really to worry about. These parts are easily replaced. If you're booking it in with a service for me, this part is replaced anyway, but if it's in good original condition, my advice is keep it exactly as it is. It's got one or two marks like this. It's the originality of everything else is in great condition keep it as it is let clean it up get all the grime and grudge around the insides you do get the odd part that the lip on the edges can move up and down there's a pair i did this week that had exactly the same and if that's the case you could try heat pressing it back down with a bit of heat and try and re-enable the original um original adhesion underneath for the adhesive um sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't my honest opinion just take it off clean all of the old adhesive pop a new trim on and clean it up before you pop it on. So no-brainer, they're not very expensive. Shader cloth is another one. You can just about see this from underneath here. You can see there's a layer of dirt underneath here. There's a shader cloth that sticks underneath the plinth in front of the pitch control housing, straight underneath. It's basically a dust guard, guys, okay? So the idea with that is you take the old one off, you pop a new one on, you get a brand new looking shader cloth, brand new looking trim, and if you get to change the slider unit over, brand new slider, and change the pot while you're at it. Right, that's what I do. So these parts can be replaced if you go to look at a pair and these are all scratched up. Don't worry about it. You can change them, okay? Same thing goes for the LEDs. If the LED 
Um, it's a different color to the other turntable because there are different, slightly different shades in green between the two different, there's different ages of the LEDs. Um, if they don't match, they weren't bought at the same time. Again, this can be easily resolved. Not very expensive. And any turntable that comes in for me to have a slight actual physical service, this LED is replaced on the pitch anyway. Okay, that's that. Sticky buttons on these as well. So if you find that you push these down, you don't really, you hear the click? If you try pushing these down and they're a bit hesitant, it could either be the actual housing itself, the plastic buttons, there's stems that sit between every single one of these. So in between each button, there's a little stem that sticks through. You may find that the, um, the actual stem, someone spilt something down it, they might have got all hard and worn, and the actual physical buttons are not moving, or the physical switches underneath on the boards need replacing. Again, not a hard job to do if you know what you're doing, which obviously I do. You can change the switches over, the tactile switches, problem solved, nice clicky switches, and that's that problem. Same thing goes for the start and stop. It's a micro switch underneath, particular type of switch, that can be replaced as well. If you've got a deck that the start and stop button doesn't work and the deck isn't working at all, again, walk away. You don't know whether it's the switch or a mainboard issue that is causing that problem. No brainer, you're going to look at a set of decks, you want them to work, yeah? So that's the pitch area talked about. The operation base area talked about. One last thing about the operation base as well. When you go to look at these in person, try to put a little bit of pressure on the black surround on either end, not too much, but just put a little bit of pressure on each corner. One here, top of the strobe, here and here. The reason, and it sounds a bit daft and people aren't going to understand this until I explain it, but the operation base is made out of plastic. It screws on underneath. You've got a screw here that mounts into the plinth. One here, 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 and here. There's also a screw that holds on the main PCB to the operation base. If you put any pressure on the edges and you see that the buttons physically dip down or the strobe physically dips down or the edge here physically dips down or in the middle, that means that the actual, either the screws underneath have become loose, which I doubt it, or the plastic lugs that go underneath the screws go into are physically cracked. Now, that's not a massive issue again. It just means that when you eventually go to get this serviced and you open the, the person opens the back up, you know, a bit of a plastic lug that will fly out. You need to replace the operation base. Again, they're discontinued. A lot of sellers do have these second hand. I've got God knows how many of them here, so that's fine. But you can also repair them. You can plastic weld them if the part is still there too. Okay. Dim LEDs, very easily sorted. It could be a mainboard issue, but nine times out of 10, because the LEDs don't blow, um, you can replace the LEDs, do the work on the mainboard to get the, uh, the brightness back up again, and you're good to go with this too. Decks that have LED colors on them, so decks that commonly have blue LEDs, green LEDs, white LEDs. What I tend to see with the majority of these turntables that have had upgrades on them, We'll call them upgrades, kits that you'll find on eBay um, and various other places. You know, they buy a kit or do it themselves. So I'll put a new LED on the pop-up. I'll put a new LED on the pitch, put a new LED on this, this, and this. You need to be wary with this, okay? Unless that person is competent with soldering, there's every chance they can cause more damage, more harm than good to the boards that these attach to. So an LED, you have two, you've got basically an anode and a cathode on the LEDs. One, logs, one, length, one leg is longer than the other when you pop them through the hole when you remove the old solder and remove the LEDs. Pop them through, bend the LEDs, solder them on, clip the legs, you're good to go. The problem is when a lot of people use these kits, they use cheap and nasty uh, soldering irons with desoldering pucks. So the idea of those hand pucks that you use where you push the button down, put it over and then push it. Um, I use a Hakko, which is a very it's about 400 pounds worth of desoldering gun. You put it on a low heat, you can adjust the heat. Solder suckers don't have that. You have to hold the heat over the top of the solder, push it down until it's right. And the problem you have is not every time when you do this does it clear all of the solder. You can apply new solder and make it easier for you to try and remove all the solder in one go. But the problem you tend to find there as well is you'll find that people are so eager to take the LEDs out and put the kits in, they put too much heat on, which in turn actually rips the pads off of the PCB or partially lifts the pads. They may still work, but the pads still may be damaged uh, or the soldering just isn't up to, up to spec really. 
Um, again, if you're having something serviced, that's an easy system for me to sort. So the PCB on the operation base is not very big. Um, you have a PCB for the strobe housing. If the LED has been changed on there, there's four LEDs that go onto the strobe. There's one obviously here and one here. So you've got 33 and 45 of their own individual. You can buy this board and you can buy the strobe PCB as well. Same thing goes for the pitch. There's a PCB that the pitch control will sit onto. If you're buying a deck that's apparently been serviced or you know has had the pitch control replaced, then again, you need to be careful because a slider unit, if I show you uh, any old slider unit I've got here, I've got quite a few of these dotted around all over the place. Again, this particular slider unit here has been replaced at some point in its life, you can see here. Um, not the greatest of jobs, but not the worst of jobs I've seen either. But you've got four points here on either end of the slider that physically solder on onto the actual slider unit. You'll also find that the, the legs of the back of the PCB, the legs of the slider, they're also kinked at a slight angle, they're bent in, then soldered down, okay? That's the potentiometer, that's for the slider unit, creates the range of the slider, and then you've got the LED that solders on here. So you've got one leg shorter than the other, like I've just stated, that's the LED. Now what you need to be careful of, you're never gonna see this unless you take the deck apart, is depending on how good the solder is, these pads can get ripped, these pads can get burnt, they can rip them out, the harnesses, they can do all sorts of things with these. These can come loose as well. So I would tend to stay clear of turntables that have had the LED kits installed by someone that's just using them at home and who's done the work themselves. And if they have done the work themselves and if they're competent at this, I would say, go on then, whip the back of the deck off and let me look at your soldering. I doubt they're gonna let you do that. But if they, again, if they genuinely want to sell them, they may very well do this. It's always good putting the question out there when buying these decks. So I would always stick to an original set that has not been molested because you know the soldering is still factory. You may have dry spots on solder or cracks, etc., but you know it hasn't been touched. So the best thing to do is go for one that has never ever been serviced and never been touched. That's the honest answer. Buying them from people that are obviously reputable retailers who deal with these every day, you are fine as long as you know the quality of their work is up to standard. Um, so you know the soldering has been done correctly, the right type of solder has been used, the correct switches, the pitch, trim, everything. There's all different types of trims you can buy out there dotted around online, cheap trims to expensive trims. You get what you pay for, right? Bearings, very important. And like I say, pitch control, I wouldn't worry too much about that. Issues where you push start and stop and the platter wants to wander around and do what it wants to do really fast. You start it up and it starts spinning around really fast. Obviously, you stay very well clear of these. It's class class as a runway speed issue. You get other ones with, like I had this week where you start them up, it moves backwards slightly then forward. You can have problems with the motor IC, problems with the pitch IC. Other resistors and capacitors could be old and worn, but these are all things that can be fixed and you know serviced. So don't worry too much. Audio cables. So these have got original audio cables because obviously this is an original deck. There are various different types of audio cables on these. You'll be able to tell when you look at them how new-ish the cables are. So this is a, a newer, we'll call it the newer end of the spectrum. They started to go in more of a rectangular shape at the top. This is the middle of the road connection I'd class this as. These cables are still in good condition. Now what tends to happen when you look at connectors, these tend to oval. Being this style of cable, these haven't. Let me quickly see if I can find one that has got oval connectors. In fact, I've got one right here. Here we go. So this is a, an older set of cables. You can see the difference. If I hold these up next to this type of cable, you can see there is a difference here. And if you look at the connectors, you see how they sit flusher inside, including the outer sleeving. That all sits flusher. And you can see at that angle that the actual connector itself has ovaled. So what happens when you connect this up into your mixer, you may find that there'll be movement, well, you will find there's movement on the actual physical connector and it may crackle. You may get in, you may get audio dropouts. It's all things that can be caused. So if you've got an older deck like this, you really do wanna change the connectors or change over the cable just to be on the safe side. They're old, they've been in there for years. It's a very, very good idea to remove the cable. It is a no brainer. Um, another thing to check out on this as well, would be this particular section here. We're gonna get into that in just a second. Uh, the reason for this is my phone's about to die. So give me a second, I'll quickly grab my cable. Right, let's see if we can plug this into my lamp because my lamp has got a LED connector on the back. Let's see if it's got enough draw and power. 
just to get us through this so I can show you. So give me just a second, guys. Hopefully this will do the job. There we go. Right, so we've got constant power now. So it's not, it was 15% my battery. <laughs> Be very careful. Um, so yeah, where was I? Yep, so the plate. Okay, now when people change over audio cables, there's a few ways that people tend to do this. They put thick and chunky cables on. And another example that I'm gonna show you here. Hang on just a second. There's hundreds of these. I've, I've literally, hang on, faster charge, new supported charge. I'm not sure the cable isn't damaged. Fine, I don't care about fast charging. Sorry guys. Um, yeah, so again, good example of this. Look how thick this particular cable is here. Connectors all look great. Don't, 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 don't quote me on that, but look at the actual thickness of the cable. If you correspond that, with the thickness of the original cable that I've got here, there is a reason why you do not fit cables this thick underneath turntables. Now what happens, first things first, you can't fit this cable inside a deck without having to modify the internal plate somehow to get this in. The second reason is, look at how you can bend the cable, right? Even at its thickest point here, you can see how much you can bend this cable. With the original cable, if I show you with this one here, and we compare the difference, it's much more malleable. You can fit it all the way in, much better curvature. This doesn't. And where I'm getting at with this is when you put the cable in the deck and you solder this down, you have to then, once the plate's installed, it has to be installed in such a set way that the cable's then angled. So when you use the height adjustment, it goes all the way down to zero. So you move the height all the way up, of course this will be fine. When you move the height all the way down to zero, you tend to find with thicker cables that the height will only go down to about one and a half. Very, very common issue I see all the time. There's plenty of these blue cables flying with me all the time. Uh, and there's various other aftermarket cables that I see with you know, internal grounding, that sort of thing. Um, again, internal grounding, there's a lot of myths around this. The truth is, guys, as long as the internal grounding job has been completed correctly, you are absolutely fine. There's no issues with using internally grounded units out at gigs. I'm very much, you know, I prefer to use a physical grounding cable because at the end of the day, You've got a grounding point that goes inside the arm that goes directly to your mixer. It'll be the cleanest signal you can get. With a, with a uh, internally grounded unit, you're basically grounded. You're put, running a cable from one end of the arm to the other internally on the PCB, and it creates the ground. There's no issues with that. The only thing I'd be more staying clear of with internal grounding is if you're using and buying a single deck for hi-fi use, and you know you're using things like valve amps, vintage hi-fi. That can cause problems. So stay clear of internally grounded decks if you're going to be using them for vintage hi-fi or just for hi-fi use full stop if you're a bit of a purist um again if someone's completed that themselves they've more than likely watched a youtube video to complete this now with internally grounded units with these myths that are flying around people saying they were never designed in this way this is how they're meant to be that's completely wrong okay the very old units after the sl120 not a lot of people realize this, unless you're a tech and you've dealt with this all the time, but the original units, they were internally grounded from factory. They had a grounding cable with them. But there was another wire that ran from two points in the arm that created the ground. You can, in theory, remove the grounding cable and your deck would work without the grounding cable connected. So whoever invented that little myth online is talking out their backside because they were originally, not the newer ones, the original, to start the SL120, they were internally grounded and had a physical grounding cable. If you speak to a reputable Panasonic repairer, like my friend over at 1200s.com, they will happily confirm this for you. It is 100% true. So if somebody's done this to their turntables and they've internally grounded them themselves, I'd be very wary. I would be wary if I'd done the LEDs and done that themselves, and I'd be more wanting to see the work that's been completed. So ask that question before you go to see the turntables. If they have photographs and they can take the back off to show you, even better. But with the plate underneath with the thicker cables, what happens is you have a block like this. It's a chop block, call it a chop block. It's like it's a, it's a cable clamp, basically. This is the internal section. And that's the outer casing. So the idea is your cable, if we get the uh, the cable I had a second ago that's now falling on the floor. If we get this cable, if you imagine the diameter of the cable here fits inside and the grounding cable will fit in there as well. The block then goes over the top and the cable will then sit like so inside. You bend the cable down, there's enough wiggle room there and you can see when you put pressure on there and pop it in the plate, the cable will not move. 
Okay, it's, you can force that, that will not move. Once it's soldered on the board and this clamp is put in place, this physical section of the block stops the cable from moving when clamped down and screwed down from the top. What happens when you use thicker cables, such as the one I've just shown you, the obvious thing you're gonna know straight off the bat is the cables do not fit the clamp. So what do you think everybody does? They don't use the clamp, they get rid of the clamp completely. This still will not fit over the cables, it just about fits over one of the cable channels, look. So you won't get this from two of them. And what they tend to do, throw that cable out of there. What they tend to do is they will then cut here at an angle or melt it down, whatever they're gonna to do, to make the diameter thicker. The problem then that you have is the plate that sits on top. So if you imagine the cables through there, I'm gonna show you actually, yeah, if I do this, if I put the cable through the tone arm backing plate or the base plate, whatever you wanna call it, it's thick enough as it is. And if you then put that over the top of it, which obviously it's not gonna fit, if you imagine that is flush on that with your cables, look from this angle. Without the plate, the backing plate, sorry, without the um, support block underneath, look how what's happening with the cable. You imagine your cable's flat, flat down like that, which it should be with that plate, in, obviously with that top in place, the plate will eat into the sleeving of the cable. It will eat into it. Just by doing this and me pushing slightly on there like that, and then lifting that out, you can already see where it's marked it. Now, if you imagine you keep taking it in, out, in, out, using it for gigs, and this cable's too thick, you know, the problem with the height, like I explained earlier, so you're not going to move the, the arm all the way down because the thickness is going to be going from thick one minute to thin, it's not going to move well. It's just too thick. Ideally, for Technics cables, you really want to have like a diameter. I tend to go under five mil per channel. So 10 is your absolute maximum diameter for cable. Sweet spot really is eight mil. It's the same really. So it fits in there, height adjusters will work properly and you're good to go. But yeah, best way of checking that out is turn the turntable up slightly. Just literally lift it up like that, lift it on its side, look underneath and you will be able to see the cable and the plate with that attached. If you've got anything other than that plate with the adjoining section, you will be able to see it. Anything that's got aftermarket cables attached and in place on will not have this blocking plate usually if the cable is thick, but you'll be able to see when it's on there, when that block is in place, you'll see it sticking through these ends either, either way here. Very, very simple to see. And that can save you a couple of quid on the PCB. Also the, um, the actual block itself and the locking section of that, because you will need that. That's a no brainer. I wouldn't let any turntable leave here without that in place. Right, so that's very, very important. If someone's changed the cables over, I wanna see proof that they put that, block, that, that um, support block back on there. Another thing to bear in mind too, is the sockets for your dust covers. If you're buying them without dust covers, these are not cheap. You can buy um, injection molded parts, they are cheap. But if you want the original units, they're not cheap. If you don't have dust covers with these, you still, you haven't got sockets, you'll need sockets, dust covers, hinges or you can just buy deck savers and slot them on. If you're buying them and wanna buy deck savers, it's fine. You may very well find that the deck will rattle slightly, there may be the plates in the back, because the sockets at the back of these here, they screw into two little plates and they screw all the way in. That's what locks these down, okay? People tend to unscrew them, completely remove the screws in the socket, put them in the bin or just put them in a drawer, forget about them, and the plates will be rattling around inside. What you should really do is undo, tighten one all the way up, loosen the other, move it down, Put the screw in because the plate will be sitting in its, you know, it's sitting in situ because you don't have so tight and put the screw in. So you have the screws in the plate at the back, but the sockets won't be there. That way it makes your life easier just buying two replacement third party sockets. If that makes sense to you. Or just buy deck savers. There's no issues with that. But if you've got marks or scuffs and scratches, very common on these decks like you see on here. Obviously there's scuff marks here from, from the, obviously the, uh, the hinges. Very common, nothing you can do to hide this really. Uh, but imagine what the plate at the back will look like. If that's what your plinth looks like, the plate at the back will look exactly the same, if not worse. So deck sailors is fantastic, but you may very well see scratches at the back. Club style like this, standing in front of them, who cares? They're in your room, you're not going to see it. If you're a perfectionist, that might bother you. Battle style, you won't really see it again. 
power cables is another thing obviously you've got the european with the two prongs on the end that goes into the bigger adapter the uk adapter very common on the later end of the series you've also got the molded plugs on a lot of these and you could buy decks that have obviously had uh, replacement uh, screw on type plugs that's fine as well as long as it's been done properly and they look all right then i wouldn't worry too much about that um you if you really want to be sure about it you can obviously take it off cut the cable strip it down and pop it back on if you don't know how to wire a plug <laughs> well i mean look there's youtube videos everywhere how to wire a plug i'm not going to explain that but it's a very simple thing to do when done properly right um but make sure with cables you've got no breaks in them that's a no-brainer really so go make your hands through the cable run it through make sure there's no nasty chips dents or you've got bare wire sticking through um these are things that people just don't think about and they're too excited to get the decks and take them home but if you've got problems like that and the sleevings come off the cable and the two bare points touch each other game over changing fuses taking the top off could cause other damage internally as well so very careful make sure you check that grounding cables is another one so grounding cables i know we covered audio side of things a second ago but grounding cables um again you tend to find the forks on these either bent <laughs> or not there at all and they've been stripped down you know again not a very hard job to sort it's about a five minute job for me to solder in one of these i can rip down a turntable in about 15 minutes i can get into the arm in five you know five minutes of that popping the new cable on there is a very straightforward job to do some of these aftermarket grounding cables you will find will be shorter than the audio cables now if somebody says to you they've got the original grounding cables on them and you go there and find that the grounding cable when you pull everything out at its highest width and you find the grounding cable is down here, doesn't go any further, and the, ground, the audio cable's up here, that is an aftermarket, it's a Panasonic unit, but it's not made for this turntable, it's just a generic Panasonic grounding cable. That wasn't the original one, the original cables would have always been up here or slightly longer than the cable. So bear that one in mind as well, but it's a very simple job to fix. If the grounding cable is still there, and it's broken off and you only got about that much wiggle room to play with but the wire can be stripped then you can buy extension cables for them which actually clip onto the wires now you can buy them like my good friends over at dj spares so you go onto ebay dj spares one of the biggest parts distributors here for technics here in the uk um go on to djspares.com take you through to his ebay store massive shout out going out to kev uh, go on there you can buy extension cords for these i'm pretty sure he still does them that gets you out of the pickle having to have a cable soldered on and you could just crimp it down or for the time being i class that as you know if you want to just do it for the time being great until you get the cable sorted or use it as it is um so it's nothing really to worry about things like flickering leds again stay clear of them there could be a more of a board fault on there could be bridge rectifier could be other different things that cause that problem could even be the motor if you're getting a buzz or a hum from the power supply make sure people are quiet around you check that um Obviously, if we're going back to, let's try and think of this, the lamps, for an example. Okay, so the lamps. Don't be put off if you push the button and the lamp does not move up fast. This one here is moving up nice and smooth. Now, what I'm trying to say is don't be put off if the lamp pops straight up and it has its original lamp in there. There was a certain period that when Technics were doing these lamps, there was a certain type of silicon oil they were using that, um, I remember the name of it now, I've actually still got some here somewhere, but the original oil they used, they stopped using it. So basically one minute you were buying turntables that they slowly went up like you were for a hi-fi, and then all of a sudden you'd push that button and they're slamming up against the top and the rubber bumper underneath is slightly thicker and bigger and longer on the newer end of the spectrum of these decks because it used to slam up and hit against the rubber bumper. So if it doesn't move up slow, not the biggest issue known to man. If you pop it up one minute, the lamp's working, then it's not. Don't be too surprised when you get it home and plug it in that this may very well blow after a certain period of time and just stop working. Now, lamps, again, they're an old thing of the old now, aren't they? It's a lamp. I mean, look, the output of this particular one isn't fantastic. Um, personally, grab yourself an upgraded lamp. Get somebody to install a lamp on there. Whoever's going to service this for you and change and upgrade or do what you're going to do. You can change the color to whatever you like. You can put a warm white SMD on there. So you've got a nice spread of light going out to the center of the uh, spindle um yeah it's a no-brainer so again not a very expensive upgrade and not expensive thing to fix but it's definitely not something i would recommend doing yourself if you have no experience with soldering and to be fair something like this regardless of your soldering experience you really should give to a technician that knows what they're doing with these decks hands down they can do it all give it back to you and you are well happy knowing that your turntable is not going to have that problem whenever i give these turntables back you get a year's warranty with service work with me but you also get a lifetime warranty on any leds that i install 
okay? So lifetime warranty on the pop-up. If it blows, you bring it back. Any of these, bring them back. Pitch go, bring it back. So LEDs, lifetime warranty, and a year's warranty on this. When you buy these from retailers, it should be exactly the same. A year's warranty, okay? Don't accept any less than that. A year's warranty, um, I want to guarantee that if anything goes wrong, I can bring it back. And that's what you should have of any retailer. Sellers that are doing these, obviously, privately, you're buying with a gamble. If that pop-up if that pop up is working one minute and isn't working the next, it's going to blow. It's down to you to resolve it. If the pitch control works one minute and starts to drift the next, it's down to you. Now, you can obviously open up disputes with eBay if you are absolutely sure that these problems were there when you bought the unit and then return it back to the seller. That's the way things tend to happen now with eBay. You get people to lie about issues, trying to return things. But with private sellers, it's a little bit more difficult. That's why you should really view these in person if you can. Um, again, very, very difficult with turntables that have been sprayed. The only real way of telling with turntables that have been sprayed, depending if this platter comes off or not. Some of them, they all vary. You'll tend to find that some of them underneath here, if I quickly grab, do you know what, I'll quickly grab my drill. Hang on a second. I wasn't gonna take this apart, but I'm going to anyway. Let's take my little, let's take my hand drill. Let's undo the screws on this. Put these down over here. One thing that never gets old with these turntables is the smell. There's a, there's a very distinct smell with Technics turntables. Those of you that have ever bought them brand new will understand exactly where I'm coming from. This is ideally what you want to be doing if you're viewing them in person. I highly doubt anybody really is going to let you do this though. But if you've got a nice enough seller, they can do it. I've done this with video calls with people before. So the board on this one, if we look at this, I can already tell straight away by looking at this, this has never been tampered with. It's never been touched. There was a lot of critique on some of the videos I've explained before when I explained about cable ties. And I'm gonna explain this in the most simplest way possible. You can tell if something has been tied down by factory. You just can. If things are loose, if they've been taken off, say for an example, this lamp here had an LED on it. I find it very hard to imagine that the LED is gonna be that tight and exactly this angle and the cable will not be rooted in exactly the same way. Most people pop them on, put it underneath or around the sides or loosely put it over the top. Don't tie it up. And the cable ties, if they're using white, is a distinctive color with these as well. So I've said this before and people laughed and took the mic online. I really don't care. This is just to help you not get ripped off. Cable ties on these, almost like a gone off white color. You can see when things are age related, they tend to change color over the years. Like with these decks, you find they have oil marks on certain areas. If you buy something and put it in front of a window and the sun's constantly hit it, like with cardboard boxes and things like that, with graphics on like the old Airfix boxes, stuff like that, you'll find they get sun damage, right? And the colors will change. These over years, they tend to change as well. So these cable ties here are like a gone off color, gone off white. But the way that they're tied in and the way that everything is on here is perfect. Cable still, so the original mains cable still in situ. It's tied down in the correct location. That's pure, definitely factory. You can even see on here with the, the thermal paste, the way this is very, very common. The thermal paste is actually hitting on the bottom of the base as well as the plinth. That's very common when they're doing this from factory. But yeah, particularly important that you see one here holding down the pop-up lamp. Going through here, supporting to the board for the operation base harness. One here for the operation base harness as well. But this is what a deck looks like from a factory. Either the cable will be up like this with white cable ties, no other color cable tie. If you're viewing this deck and they let you take this apart and they tell you this has never been apart, never been worked on, and you've got black cable ties, red cable ties, anything other than white, I would be a little bit hesitant to believe them, okay? And you can tell by looking at this video, if you were to zoom in or anything on your computer or what you're looking at, you can see the way that these cables are, the way that everything is wound down, and even from the levels of dust. You're gonna expect, if something has never been touched, if they dust it over and clean it, fair enough. You may very well find that they're nice and clean, but this is predominantly what every turntable will look like when you open it up, clean-wise. I don't mean the boards looking the same. The boards are all practically identical. You'll find the pots will look different. So these are a newer end of the spectrum. You'll find you've got blue pots, there's silver pots, you've got white edge pots. Um, you'll find some of them have white 
sockets with white wiring harnesses on them. Um, you know, there's all different things to look out for. The spindle as well, you make sure that moves nice and smoothly. If it's very hard to move, that means it's never been oiled in its life. Most DJs I speak to don't even bother oiling their spindle and never knew they had to do it. So other DJs you get to buy the actual Panasonic oil that was designed for these when they were from new. But the idea is you can move it up and down slightly and there is nice smooth movement from the spindle itself as well. But here we've got the original power cable going through. I'm not going to touch anything, obviously, because it's... I don't want to kill myself, but you've got the cable going through here, positive and negative connection here. Going through, you've got the original glass fuses on this. Um, yeah, that's just a genuine unit from the inside. There really is nothing really I can really do changing the board round of things. It's pointless because this is an original unit. But I'm just giving you this as an example. So the way that the, the wires have been done and the way they've been housed and the thermal grease, that's an original unit. OK, um, what I was getting at was when people respray these, technically, when they respray them, there's a few ways they'll do it. They'll either do exactly the same where they'll take everything out, strip everything down, spray everything over, prime it, spray it, lacquer over the top if you're lucky. What they tend to do is either go all the way over and you wouldn't know any different unless you looked at the graphics and saw they're not original. Or they'll go around to the edge lip here or the edge lip here. So look out for any differences in colour different shades it's very obvious if something's been sprayed and, and then over sprayed so where i'm getting at is if this has been sprayed you'd see the color difference between the base to the top if they've done it in two sections but again i can appreciate this is very difficult to do with a seller <laughs> you know they've had genuinely a nice person and they've had them all their life you know they've got the boxes for them and everything backs up the serial numbers match the boxes that's very important as well then you're good to go Plastic cover on these, again, the five screws that hold these down. Very, very simple to do. I'm not going to screw this in on the video. There's no point. The platter underneath as well. This is actually very important. You see this circular section here? You want to make sure that nothing has been bent or misshapen where someone's taken this off. You've got the ridges around here as well. You want to make sure that none of these are churned, scratched and scuffed. And there's also no damage or chips to the magnet. No one ever gives this any thought when they're looking at turntables. So make sure this is not damaged, pushed in or misshapen. Okay, and make sure the magnet is not loose and make sure that the magnet has nothing stuck to it and there's no chips. If any of that's on there, that means that this platter has been off a few times. There's no other way around that other than doing that. So we've gone over on this video, power cable, audio cables, bearings, pitch, trim, shader cloth, pop-up, switches, uh, operation base in general, the platter. We're showing you the insides. Now, again, I don't want people getting judgmental about showing you the insides and things to look at because I can appreciate every deck is different. If someone's had this apart and they're being honest, they should tell you. And that way you know that if you give this into somebody like myself, you expect things to have been changed. If a board has been faulty, there's nothing wrong with changing a board out. Some people don't know how to repair the boards. And sometimes it is quicker to repair a board. If you have a deck here that's fully serviced and a board here that's serviced and the board is faulty on a deck you're about to service, the option's there to change the board over if you need it. So you've always got to back up there. I've got probably 20 or 30 boards here that are in for repair at the moment. It's always easy to give somebody another board. But you don't, you want to try and avoid that as much as possible. There's no point giving it to a supposed technician who cannot repair the board that you're giving it to them for and just giving you a replacement. What's the point of that? Quick and easy? Yeah, definitely. If you've got brakes on tracks and, you know, burnt pads or people that tried to replace the power components or the diodes and things and they've bent them and burnt the tracks out, yes, you can obviously UV mask new wires and make new traces, but sometimes it is quicker and easy just to go, look, this board's been mullered. <laughs> Someone's been in there. They've taken everything out. They've ripped this apart. Buy this board. Do your discount. I'll keep that board. Repair it at a later date. That's the best way to do it for a quick and easy fix and keep your customer happy unless you know how to repair it, which obviously I do. But that is always two sides of the spectrum and what you can and can't do. So that's the basics of this, but don't take the insides of this like too lightly. Like I said, don't, don't take a pinch of salt with the insides. It all depends on what the person is selling you. If they've never taken it apart, it should be, just be dusty and what I've shown you. The other thing to bear in mind about this is very common as well is the height adjustments, they can get seized. Okay, they pretty much seize them just about every deck I get in here. Where I say seize, I mean the height adjustments do not move. This one is no exception. It doesn't move. I can grab hold of the side of the base here and try to move this. There is literally no movement on this at all. Now, you can, there's various different ways you, you can try and to de-seize this when you get home, which might be worth a try if you have the bits here to do it. 
First thing you can try, it sounds ridiculous, if you haven't got a heat gun on a low setting, which is very important because obviously it's made out of plastic that surrounds on top of this, um, you do not want to hit this at high heat because you'll end up melting the actual, the height adjuster ring section or it comes loose from the adhesive. You do not want to do that because you'll be in deep doo-doo if you do. But again, heat gun on low heat, go around the sections of the arm and keep trying to move it backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards while you put the heat on it. Or a hairdryer. Sounds ridiculous. A hairdryer. Go around there and just keep trying to move it. You really do want to get some sort of penetrant oil in there, really, because what you've got on here, the base obviously has its own threads that go around. You then got the ring itself has threads on the outside to go to the base and the inside that goes to the main arm base itself for the arm assembly. Right, so there's three different sections that move. If one section is seized completely, you'll find that sections will move, but that you will never get it undone. So heat is your friend with this and penetrant oil. Obviously, I take these, I take these apart and strip these down. It's a no-brainer with me. Heat is a number one thing with this, really. Um, the locking section here. Do not, if this is pushed all the way in, some of these are pushed all the way to the point if they're actually flush you know, flat flush this way. If that has happened with yours and you cannot undo this with your fingers, do not under any circumstances get a pair of grips or screwdriver and attempt to push this back. Two things could happen. One, you loosen it and you end up chipping the plastic itself on the, on the switch and also on the lock, I mean, and also to actually scratch the base itself, which you'll be gutted about if the deck is in good condition. So please don't do that. Two is do not get a pair of grips directly on top of this, even if it's got a cloth or anything, and attempt to move this yourself from the top. You can snap that off if it's on too tight. You really can. I've seen this happen. You can snap that off and you'll need a replacement. Um, the best way to have that unlocked is from the inside. Anybody that works on these will tell you this. You can take the base off at a set angle and then you can loosen that from underneath. You don't need to force that at all. So if it doesn't move and you're planning on giving this to somebody for a service, Great, let them do it. Don't even touch it. If it's seized at zero or seized at four, nine times out of 10 when it's seized at four, if the arm's in good condition, usually what I tend to find is with concords with good condition arms, around the four mark with the height is around the right height to make sure that the arm is level with your record. Everything's gonna differ. Every turntable's gonna differ depending on the condition of the arm and the tube, etc. But that's very important. The other thing to watch out for with these as well is cracks. I didn't mention that before. This section in the middle and underneath the gimbal is made out of plastic. It's cracks across the top or the bottom. Normally it's the bottom, so make sure you check this. If that's cracked, you need a new assembly or a 3D printed part, but I'd be looking at a new assembly. Okay, anti-skate on this, I've already shown you already. Now, DJs, you should be having these at zero regardless, so that way you've got minimal movement and play between the record when you're queuing and scratching. Some people like setting it up, so they've got three grams on the top here, it'd be three grams. Anything over is just on three. Um, but me, zero, and then set your height accordingly, depending on what you want to do. Very important thing to watch out for. The other thing as well is the feet. People do not think about checking the feet on these. So if I give you an example of a foot, obviously there's plenty of these sitting here, with boxes full of feet, but this is another example. Now, obviously the inner section here is made out of absorbent rubber. Now what can happen over years and years of just sitting there in one place is where it's been pushed down correctly. You've got a spring that's inside here, a big, cold sp a big spring that sits underneath this felt pad. The rubber can crack and perish. If that cracks and perishes all the way around, this will come off, your spring will want to come out, and your foot will come off completely. So make sure that you check the feet. They simply unscrew from underneath the deck. That's a good thing to check because the feet are expensive. Second hand on a foot, you're looking at about 30 quid a pop. If you think you've got two decks and all of these are all of these are broken, even if you've got two of them that are broken, it's 60 quid minimum. You can buy Mark 7 feet and pop them straight on. They're exactly the same about minus the lip being polished. They go straight on as well if you want to do that. If you're modifying your decks and want to do that, it's not a bad idea. But check these first. There's no point in changing them if they're not broken. So make sure they're okay and in fully working order. So I like I've just said, fully working order with this is make sure nothing is perished. There's no cracks and they're not physically moving around. They also come all around the edge here, can come loose as well underneath. You also find that a lot of these, the, uh, the brass section inside that can be polished will move around. If it does come loose completely, don't worry too much. That can be adhesive back down so it doesn't move. Just I wouldn't do that yourself unless you're very confident with gluing it down though. But that can be done. So yeah, feet, very, very expensive if you're buying a full set of feet. So bear that in mind. So if you're buying a turntable for 500 quid, like this one here, if you're buying it for half a grand and you need a new feet, 
you add that on your price. £30 per foot. Expensive. Arm assembly. Like I've said, if it's cracked here and your bearings are damaged and the tube's damaged, you really should replace the entire assembly. There's one of these going in Colchester at the moment at a cash converter shop. The arm is bent. Bearings are knackered. This is all damaged under here. And so many people call me up saying, Jay, should I buy it? No, it's £500. You've got a bent arm assembly. This entire section here from this brace, pivots, bearings, se section with the gimbal, the section with the tube and the socket is two and a half, nearly £300. And the problem is you can't buy the genuine old styles of these anymore. You have to buy the newer styles from the Mark 7, the GR series, that sort of thing. They fit directly on the base. That's the only option that you have unless you're going to start buying secondhand parts and hoping for the best. You know, when you buy things on eBay, oh, it works perfectly. Are you really sure about that? Everyone's got their own idea of perfect. Everyone's got their own idea of fully working order. So this is where it's very important that if you can view these in person and physically test them out, you should be doing it. Movement on the platters as well is another thing to check out with this. If you've got really bad loosers, this one's quite firm. It's a good, this is good. Okay, so there's very minimal movement when I'm moving this. It takes a lot of effort to move this physically up and down. A lot of these turntables I get in, you find it's worn around the spindle area where it slots in and you can physically move it up and down to the point of it's like a belt drive turntable. That's obviously a no-go and you'd need to replace your platter. <laughs> right? Another very expensive part. Doesn't matter how good condition it is, if that inner section there it sits in, if the whole section for it is, is worn and it moves, there's nothing you can do. So just walk away just walk away if it's that bad and that's pretty much really the main parts you should look out for again it's very hard to give you judgment on these on these guys when it comes to things like graphics i mean you've seen videos i've obviously looked at before look at the previous ones i've done where they've been wrapped powder coated but these are all obvious things if they've been obviously sold as refurbished then fine it's when you're buying something that's sold as an original unit that's been non-molested and untouched that's when you need to start worrying but these are all basic things to check out so we've gone over now let's just go over this and recap we've gone over the operation base the, the pop-up the pitch the trim the shader we've gone over the pcbs obviously the damage that can cause the pop-up what that can cause if you need to replace the arm assembly again very expensive and all these parts here would need to be replaced the locking section the locking ring itself uh, another thing as well is the lever lift. Now you find on some of these, they might not lift at all. They might not want to go back down or the plastic section here is spinning around. They can have hairline cracks on here too. They can be pulled off easy. You can replace them. Um, if the lever lift doesn't work at all, there's a flathead screwdriver section in here. I think you can really see it from the angle of my camera, but you can get a flathead screwdriver in there and loosen it and then move the lift and see if it moves after that or loosen it down, tighten it up. Um, weight on the back. There shouldn't really be any looseness. It shouldn't just fall off. That should be nice and firm. Again, it's a very simple fix to fix. If it does, bear that in mind as well. Loose sockets, like this one here has got on one of these I spotted a minute ago. If the sockets are loose, it is a simple thing to adjust, but you need to take the base of the deck off. Obviously, make sure that all the screws are intact underneath as well. Make sure no screws are missing. That's usually a telltale sign that if any screws are missing or churned and the, the stems have been snapped off, that means that's been opened at some period in its life. So the most important things, like I say, is just make sure that you ask the right questions, okay? If you are buying these blind, go over this video and ask the questions to the person that's selling them. If they get frustrated with you and aren't bothered about it, then they know damn well there's either something wrong with the deck or they're just not too fussed about it, guys. No one's, you know, it's, it's very, very hard. I mean, if they're at the right price and you buy something cheap, there's a reason why it's cheap. It's either they want to get rid because they need the money or there's a problem with them and they don't want to spend the money to get them repaired. Oh, he's calling me. On that note, guys, I better shoot because the other half's calling me. <laughs> but any questions or comments or anything, um, feel free to pop them below. Anything that you feel I've missed on this video that I can recap on, I'm more than happy to go over this for you. And uh, there we go, guys. And I'll see you again on another video. Thanks so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. Take it easy. See you later, guys.